The uh, message today will focus on the gospel reading from Luke chapter 6, uh, but we're going to see the same theme throughout all the readings. <coughs> you listen carefully. We first of all hear from Jeremiah the prophet, the Old Testament prophets, from chapter 17. Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness, in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water, that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And now the epistle reading comes to us from the first letter to the Corinthians, the 15th chapter as we hear from the Apostle Paul, reading it, beginning at verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise to sing the Alleluia. <clears throat> Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. These sins are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Hallelujah. sixth chapter of Luke, beginning at verse 17, we read in the name of our Savior and Lord. Glory to you, O Lord. Uh, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place with a, cr a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. 
for so their fathers did the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ. And now we make our confession as expressed in the words of the Nicene Creed, also found on the back inside cover of your hymnal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and he was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn.
Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight. Amen. Amen. A grace and mercy and peace be unto all of you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A dear redeemed in Christ. Well, we've all heard the, uh, the bad news and the good news jokes, right? You probably have a whole uh, album of them in your mind. I'm not going to tell you any of those today necessarily, but I thought of that. I thought of that paradigm when I was looking at these lessons this week, and particularly uh, the lesson in Luke, where we have the Beatitudes uh, delivered by our Lord, not only to his disciples, but to a great group that was gathered there. Uh, the bad news and the good news. And so if we look at the prophet Jeremiah, we see also that dynamic at work. Because he said, Cursed is the man who trusts in man, who makes uh, flesh his strength. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. That makes all the difference, doesn't it? And so you've got <laughs> the cursed person, you've got the blessed person. It's also true as we look at the epistle reading from 1 Corinthians, uh, where Paul entertains the hypothetical bad news that if Christ is not raised from the dead, then we're still in our sins, and we are of all people most miserable. But then the good news of that is since Christ has indeed risen from the dead, yes, we are forgiven and we have new life in him. And then we've got Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. And uh, there's familiarity with Matthew chapter 5, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. But this is what we have here now. Uh, we've got the bad news and we've got the good news. We've got the bad news expressed uh, by woe, right? Woe is the person. And then we've got the good news expressed by the word blessed. Now, in the Hebrew language, this is how you say blessed, ashrei. You want to say that with me? Ashrei. Doesn't that sound beautiful? Yeah, not only the word sounds beautiful, but the message is even more beautiful because it is the good news that Jesus is giving to those who would hear and believe that you are blessed. Now in this epiphany season, we see that Jesus is manifested to be God's eternal son. He's not just another human being, he's not just another rabbi, but he is God's Son who came down from heaven and he delivers the word and the truth of his heavenly Father to all the world. You and I are still hearing this word as it is proclaimed from the scriptures through the medium of preaching and teaching. Yes, this Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. And that's what we just sang. Manifested manifested. And so this Jesus shows himself to be more than just a man. And in his teaching, he shows himself to be delivering words that come from heaven. You know, Luke likes to present Jesus as the preacher and the teacher and the healer. And we see all of that in this text here because there were people being brought to Jesus who were ill. They had all kinds of illnesses, and Jesus was healing them. It says that they tried to touch him, for power was coming out of him, and he healed them all. That's what the text says. He healed them all. It was good news for them, and they knew that they were blessed. You know, the word that we translate to be power is the Greek word that we get dynamite. 
And so the teaching of Jesus was dynamite, just as his acts of healing were dynamite. He blows everybody out of the water by what he says and what he teaches. The power of God. And that powerful word is still present for you and I. You and I who have been baptized into Christ, into the name of the triune God. That's a powerful thing. Releasing us from our natural destiny of death and destruction, being cursed and separated from God. Now we have been brought in by his washing, by his sanctification, by his justification. And yes, we have been made children of the Most High God. We are part of his family and we are heirs of eternal life. And so that's the powerful word that is combined with the simple water that has been placed upon each of you. And yes, this word of Jesus is powerful. Yes, in that those who are hungry will be satisfied, especially when we think about the Lord's Supper, to which you are invited in a few moments. That powerful word, ever since he first gave it, is still in effect. That this is my body and this is my blood given and shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And that those who are hungry will be satisfied. So that word dunamis, dynamite, the power of Christ. That's what we see in Luke's gospel. That's what all the gospel writers want us to see and believe about Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, your Savior. And so, we have the structure of this sermon. We've got four things that are listed in the blessing part. And then we've got four that are listed in the woe part. Okay? And so you see that balance there, don't you? Poetically, structurally. But then you also see how Jesus inverts things. He's talking about the kingdom of God. He's not talking about how we perceive things in the world or what other people may happen to tell us or try to convince us of, but he is giving us that dynamite teaching which turns everything upside down. The kingdom of God. And that's what he brings into the world through his preaching and teaching and healing. Yes, we can say that the kingdom of God is among us as we preach and receive and hear his word and sacrament. It's among us. You know, we may be spending uh, all of our days trying to build up our own earthly kingdom, you know? We might try to define ourselves by how big our portfolio is or how many friends we might uh, have people that speak well of us, right? That's what we might be trying to do. But you know what? The Lord says, woe. Woe to that project. Woe to those who are rich. To those who want everyone to say great things about them. That's a word of woe. Woe. Jesus balances out, right? Rich and the poor, those who weep, those who laugh, those who are hungry, those who are well fed, those who people speak well about, versus those who are persecuted and spoken ill against because of the name of the Son of Man. See how all those things uh, balance there. And he turns everything upside down. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Yours is the kingdom of God. Notice how there is the present reality 
And then there is the future reality. Great is your reward in heaven. Yes, you are hungry, but you will be well fed. You are poor, but you are part of God's kingdom. You are rich and wealthy. Let me refer to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, right? We talked about this in our men's retreat yesterday, but it's a very provocative parable because it touches on what we are hearing from Jesus. Remember, it was the rich man who has no name, no name, but the rich man who fared sumptuously. He ate great delicacies and had great food every day, could probably go to any restaurant he wanted and enjoy the best of his time. But then there was poor Lazarus, and he's got a name, you know. Lazarus, which means God is my helper. That's what it means. He's got Lazarus out there, you know, outside his gate. You know, they build walls, you know. The rich often do to keep out the riffraff. But Lazarus was there, and he was begging. He was hungry. And he really wouldn't get anything from this rich man who had no compassion on him. But see, Jesus reverses everything and says, you know, eternally speaking, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom. He bosom, he was safe and secure. Whereas the rich man, well, the roles had reversed. And he was not in a good situation. There was a great chasm between Lazarus with Abraham and where this rich man who had no compassion, he couldn't even get a drop of water uh, to give him a drink in that very heated place. But Lazarus has a name, and Lazarus is enjoying the good things. Even though he was hungry, right, he would be satisfied, and that would be for eternity. So you see the big difference, don't you, between just this life, which is a slice of our total existence and eternity, which Jesus is always addressing because he is the one who has come from the eternal one and is the eternal one and returns as the eternal one. And he rules us in his kingdom as the eternal one. Think about those who weep. You know, hell is described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's the future, right? But there's a lot of people that laugh. They laugh. I mean, you know, it's one thing to have a comedian to try to change our mood for a while. And sometimes comedians can have clean jokes. But... You know, some people look at life and have the attitude that life's just a big joke or a big ride. And what I think about, like, recently is the New York legislatures, le legislators, they have recently passed a new abortion bill. And they were known to be celebrating and laughing about this new development which allows doctors and parents uh, to do away with the child in the third trimester, even after that child is delivered. That child can be set aside, and the decision can be made to whether let that child live or die. And people celebrate that. Yeah, but the Bible says that even though you're laughing now, God has the last laugh, right? You will weep. Gnashing teeth. Think about the reverse of that, weeping and being comforted. Think about Lazarus, the other Lazarus, the friend of Jesus, uh, who kind of died suddenly in the prime of his life. Jesus was away, and so uh, when Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, 
uh, called for Jesus. He didn't come right away. Lazarus had been dead in the tomb for four days. And Jesus wept with the sisters. And that's one of the shortest passages of the Bible. Jesus wept. But blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who weep. For you will be comforted. And they were comforted by the power, the dynamis of Jesus' word. What did Jesus do after weeping with them? He prayed to his father and he called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth from the grave. And that's what he did. He came forth bodily from the grave with the grave clothes on. And Jesus says, take off the grave clothes. Can you imagine the celebrating the proper celebrating and laughing that would accompany that event? Well, think about it in a bigger sense of you and I. When we are called to our eternal home, right? Yeah, we may die and people may weep and lament, but in the Christian community, we are able to rejoice because of the reward. The reward that is promised by God himself in Christ Jesus. He that believes in me will never die. You know, we also, uh, at our retreat, talked about the difference between being nice and being good. In the context of biblical masculinity what it means to be a man after the model of Christ. And you know, we kind of have that tendency for wanting everyone to say good things about us. And that's really what eulogy is, the word that's used. We, we kind of want that, don't we? But we know that life is sort of a battle, right? It's a spiritual battle. And whether we're parents or whether we're, you know, employees or church people or whatever, you know, we're not going to have, we're going to have some enemies, right? And it's important that we have enemies for the right reason. You may be persecuted because of your affiliation with Christ and what he says and what he does. You know, you may not always be nice. If you were to ask my kids who are now grown but back when they were teenagers, if you would have asked them 20 years ago, they might say that oh, Tom and Joe weren't all that nice. But you know, we'd say to them, it's for your good, right? It's for your good. And so that's what we recognize, that God is after goodness. That's his virtue. That's who he is. God good. See the connection? And yes, the difference. Not everybody may have good things to say about you. They didn't say everything good about the prophets, right? But rejoice because your reward in heaven is great. Psalm 1 also follows that wonderful paradigm. And we, we did that responsibly. Blessed Blessed is the man who does not walk, stand, or sit among the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And he is like a tree planted by streams of water, and he brings forth fruit, and everything he does prospers, but not so with the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind will blow away. The Lord remembers the righteous. Those who believe in him, those who trust in him, and believe in his word, his powerful word, about what it means to be truly rich and what it means to be truly fed and what it means to be truly happy. Yes. Blessed are you. The world may not tell you that, but Christ Jesus, our Lord, instills it very, very clearly, very intentionally. So, you might want to look up some 
good, uh, some jokes that are, you know, the bad and the good? The bad news? The good news? Well, we got all of that here in our text today. We call it law and gospel, don't we? Well, blessed are you for believing what Jesus tells you. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever, world without end. Amen. Amen. And may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.